was one of the founders of psychoanalysis, which is a set of psychological theories and methods aiming to release repressed emotions and experiences. He made huge contributions to the fields of psychiatry, anthropology, archaeology, literature, philosophy, psychology and religious studies. Jung's philosophy is called Jungian philosophy and some of his most important books are Psychology of the Unconscious, Man and His Symbols, The Archetypes and the Collective Unconscious, Modern Man in Search of a Soul, The Psychology of the Transference, Memories, Dreams and Thoughts, and The Relations Between the Ego and the Unconscious. Jung's mentor was the famous psychologist Sigmund Freud. However, he split from him, founding his own school of psychology called Analytical Psychology. Analytical psychology focuses on the present as well as mythology, folklore and cultural experiences with the purpose of integrating the human consciousness. One of the most important aspects of this analytical psychology which Jung founded is the process of individuation. Jung considers the process of finding the self and realizing your potential as an important task in human development. To help you understand how to use Jung's teachings to realize your full potential in life, today we bring you eight lessons that you can learn from the philosophy of Carl Jung. Number one, don't let others define you. Jung said, the world will ask you who you are, and if you don't know, the world will tell you. Jung departed from Freud in many ways. One way was that he didn't consider that all psychological diseases come from some childhood traumas or that he was not for the concept of the superego, which for Freud represents the voice of conscience, the voice of other people inside ourselves. It's formed in childhood based on what parents and educators told us regarding what's good and what's bad and who we should be. Jung believed that the internal voice which demands us to behave in one way or another can have many different causes and isn't limited to biological ones or to past events from childhood or teenage years. Jung thought that our behavior is also influenced by future aspirations and by the way we see ourselves. When we don't have a realistic and positive outlook of ourselves and of our future, we're weaker with less resistance to face the possible aggressions from other people or from the environment, and these can make us vulnerable to psychological diseases. The world constantly demands us to be in one way or another, and sometimes it gets aggressive with us, testing our limits. What we need to do is to diminish its voice and increase the voice of our own self. From the moment we're born, we're somehow forced to copy others, starting even before our school years. If your self is weak, then you'll listen to them. You'll do whatever others demand you to do. However, in time, you will grow bitter, full of resentment and regrets that you didn't follow your own way of being. Don't try to copy anyone, but rather reflect first on what you really value in life. Do you value more security or freedom? Are you more competitive or collaborative? Are you an explorer? Or do you feel better following a routine schedule and so on? Don't pretend to be someone you're not. For example, don't try to force yourself to appear to be outgoing when in truth you're an introvert. This will only damage you in the long run. You need to always question yourself, who you really are, what your likes and dislikes are, and who you really want to be in the future. Only after you've been through this introspection would you know what actions to take and how to impose your will on the world instead of letting the world overwhelm you with its demands? No matter your age, you should still invest effort in finding your own style, your own voice, your own behavior and your own way to conduct your life. To live a good life, you need to live a life which represents you. Without knowing what makes you unique, you can't know what kind of activities you should pursue that can help you reach your true potential. Number two, understand your passions. In the words of Jung, a man who has not passed through the inferno of his passions 
has never overcome them. As one of the founders of psychoanalysis, Jung understood how important it is for his patients to have the courage to face the subconscious elements, which are usually repressed desires. For example, sexual desires or desires to harm somebody else, or a desire for performing an activity that can put you in an embarrassing situation. Only when we have this courage to face them, can we heal ourselves from them. When we run away from what upsets us, what makes us uncomfortable or scares us, that thing will come back to haunt us even worse, affecting our behavior and increasing our anxiety. These subconscious elements are usually related to repressed desires or passions. We usually repress them because they're either immoral and unacceptable from society's point of view, or they're too overwhelming and we're not able to cope with them at all. When we have an aloof attitude towards life, when we're passive, reacting slowly to external events, avoiding social contacts, we're usually running away from our passions, or, in other words, from strong emotions which affect our behavior, especially when they're repressed. For example, you might have a passion for communicating with other people, you might have the potential of becoming a great public speaker, but you have a childhood trauma. One adult made fun of you and your way of speaking when you were a child, and this event made you fear opening yourself up to other people and risk being embarrassed again. The best way to heal from such anxieties and discover your real passions again is to practice more journaling, analyze your dreams, get to know yourself better, be more forgiving with yourself, make time for things you really care for, learn to overcome your fears step by step. Looking at the given example, you could take some lessons in public speaking and maybe discover just how talented you are and how unjustified your fear was. Get more in touch with what makes you feel alive and more knowledgeable about the inner workings of your inner passions. Number three, focus on who you want to be. To quote Jung, I am not what happened to me. I am what I choose to become. Although Jung was deeply interested in mythology and even came up with the concept of collective unconscious, which is the part of our unconscious that's common to all human beings, deeply influencing us in many aspects of life without our awareness, he was for a stronger development of our conscious capabilities to decide our own fate. It's also possible that precisely because of knowing how vulnerable we are to the unconscious elements, Jung emphasized on the importance of choosing who we want to become and integrating all the unconscious elements into this identity, even the components of our immature psyche, for example, some attitudes that we picked up in childhood, like a constant desire for love and attention or the fear of abandonment. We need to integrate them over time into a well-functioning whole, which is our individuality. This process of integration Jung called individuation. What defines us is the end goal towards which we aim, this being the well-functioning whole, what we choose to become. Having a goal regarding the person we wish to become is extremely important for the good functioning of our psyche. If we don't know who we want to become, how we want to represent ourselves in the face of the world, we'll just go with the flow. One danger in living your life as it comes, without putting your will to work, without putting effort into thinking through when taking important life decisions, is that you might find yourself in a situation that completely copies a traumatic episode from your past. When we leave our life to the unconscious driver, it leads us back to something unresolved from early times, and it's usually a negative experience that we need to find an answer for. For example, if you come from a dysfunctional family in which you were neglected or perhaps even abused, if you just follow your instincts or your heart in choosing your life partner, you risk ending up in the same type of household, copying the same situation. Following your instincts blindly and not using your reason into taking decisions that prevent you from making the best decisions in life and from realizing your potential. The immature element of the psyche in this example is the fear of abandonment, 
and this fear makes you search for the same pattern of dysfunctionality. To overcome this fear, you need to have a clear vision of where you really want to end up, make a clear and rational plan on how to get there, and follow through, not giving too much attention to your doubts and fears. Thus, while focusing on who you want to become, you integrate the components of your immature psyche into this new personality who isn't afraid anymore. To avoid being a victim of your fears and your past, you need to spend more time with yourself, reflect on your past experiences, think what they can teach you, understand that they don't define you. What defines you is who you want to become. Then you have to decide who you really want to become and strive in real life to be that person. Number four, give up your addictions. Jung teaches us that every form of addiction is bad, no matter whether the narcotic be alcohol, morphine, or idealism. Addiction is a serious problem affecting people on many levels, including the biological, social, psychological, and even spiritual levels. Jung encountered many types of patients suffering from addiction. However, he saw some similarities between people with real addictions like alcohol, some compulsory gestures and so on, and people suffering from idealism. We sometimes become fixated on some ideal views over life, avoiding seeing that reality is completely different than that rosy picture. We just try to find ways to escape facing the real problems of life, of what really hurts us because we don't feel capable of facing those issues. That's why we find refuge in drugs, alcohol and idealism. To maintain our healthy psyche, we need to be in touch with reality, not avoid it. If you don't like that you are overweight and unsuccessful in life, don't waste your days with narcotics, drugs, alcohol or idealism, but rather have the courage to face reality, make a plan to change the situation, apply more aggressively to jobs and consistently follow a workout routine. If you continue to spend your days partially unconscious or stuck in some damaging idealism, you can't get in touch with your real self. You can't think of any solution of how to get unstuck from the situation you're in and start developing a plan to change your life into a life which better reflects yourself and gives you the chance to realize your potential. Number five, be honest about your capabilities. Jung considers that you are what you do, not what you say you'll do. As a psychoanalyst, Jung always saw through his patients, no matter what they pretended to be. We are almost never who we pretend to be. What we do speaks for oneself much louder than anything we communicate verbally. The process of individuation which Jung wrote about implies aligning your actions with your ideal about yourself. We're born with a self which needs a lifetime to be brought to a full realization. At the beginning of life, we're not even sure who we want to be. Jung considered that the first stage of life is dedicated to both ego development and personal development, the image we show to the world. However, we need the second stage as well, the stage when we should reach a full integration of ourself. In the first stage, you're not even sure who you truly are, so you just experiment with different ways of living. Once you reach about 40, the second stage begins, and you should get a much clearer idea of who you really want to be, and so you should align all of your actions with that image of yourself. Even before this stage, it's always good practice to keep your word and have a realistic view over your time limits and skills, and this view should be formed according to your past experiences. If every time you studied for an exam just the night before, and you always got a lousy mark. Maybe you shouldn't do that next time if you want better marks. In the same way, if your boss asked you if you could do this task by tomorrow, don't rush to say yes, especially if you know that you're really not that strong in that area and it would be very likely that you'll need the help of another colleague and that it will take you much longer than a well-practiced expert. If you fail in delivering your promises repeatedly, 
people will stop trusting you and your words won't mean anything to them anymore. It's okay at the beginning of life to overpromise and push your limits to accomplish certain things, but there will be a time in your life when you need to draw some conclusions regarding your limits and you need to align your promises according to those conclusions. In our journey to reach our potential, it's important to face our limits which can be considered as good indicators to turn around and do other projects instead. It's always better to be honest with yourself first and with others regarding your capabilities. It can help you enormously to find the most appropriate path for you to achieve your potential. The more honest you are regarding what you can do and what you can't, the faster you can find those activities which you can excel at with minimum effort and the faster you can find your way to achieve your potential. Number six, make strengths from your weaknesses. Jung stated, I regret many follies which sprang from my obstinacy, but without that trait, I would not have reached my goal. In his book, Memories, Dream, Reflections, Jung reflected on his life and how different it could have been if he himself was different. He considered himself being too obstinate, stubborn, but at the same time he acknowledged that without his stubbornness, he would not have reached such successes in his life as he did. In some ways, any weakness can prove to be a strength if it's explored in the right direction. Perhaps outside the professional world, Jung's obstinacy was wrongly placed, but in professional life, this proved to be the best tool to achieve success. Find a connection to the infinite. As we learn from Jung, the decisive question for man is, is he related to something infinite or not? That is the telling question of his life. Although Jung liked to be viewed as a man of science, his work has deep metaphysical implications. This is due to the fact that he could see many of people's problems could be solved if they were able to add a metaphysical dimension to their life. It can be religion or another type of spirituality. When our life is understood in the context of something bigger than ourselves, our life gets more meaning and we start to feel more secure and happier, stronger to tackle life's problems. Even if you're not religious or particularly spiritual, it's recommended by Jung to link your existence to something infinite. Perhaps you could think about the universe and how everything is connected coming from the same source, including every human being that has and will ever exist. The effort you put into your work, the kindness you show to humans around you, can be reinforced by the thought that you're part of this human species and your life matters. You're one of the millions of forms through which our species evolved and continues to expand. Looking at all the amazing advancements of human civilizations can leave us amazed and fascinated, and we can feel grateful that we're part of this human civilization. Some people can see the infinite in their faith, in God. Some in the mysteries of the universe. Some can see the infinite in their children, our successors who will continue to expand human civilization. The infinite can be described as anything which gives you a meaning beyond your time-limited existence. Your connection to this infinite can boost your desire to want to reach your potential here on Earth and give your contribution to human society whatever your primary reason might be, whether that's religious, spiritual or otherwise. Number 8. Make time for deep reflections. In our final quote from Jung for this video, he says, You must be alone to find out what supports you when you find that you cannot support yourself. Jung has personally seen solitude as one of the best ways to heal oneself, and he even said that solitude makes life worth living. To find happiness and realize our potential, we need to live in harmony with our inner demands, and solitude is the best occasion to discover what our inner demands are. This is especially true when you face difficulties in life and feel helpless. You should go into solitude to reflect on what can give you meaning in life, what can support you emotionally, and what steps you should take next to realize your true potential. 
Maybe a stroll by the lake can make you understand that life's beauty doesn't rely on how many bucks you have in your wallet or how many titles you hold, but on the happiness and the state of peace you feel when you have most of your affairs in order. That you perform in life those activities which make you feel happy and fulfilled, helping you realize your potential. Think of what activities make you happy. Don't hold back. Imagine money was no object. What truly makes you happy? Identify that, and you're now free to stop and think. To find ways to focus your energy on those activities which help you realize your potential. Realizing your potential is a journey, and solitude can provide moments of reflection that can help you assess how far you are on this journey, and what you should do to advance more.